PCN is brought to you in part by the following underwriters. Welcome to the show. I'm Julie Thompson here with Maureen Bates. This week on PAC TV Community News, meet the Mattachesett Garden Club, stop into an art gallery opening, and hear the beat at a drum circle benefit. We will also bring you to a comedy fundraiser that benefits the Plymouth Area Coalition for the Homeless. Pet Health brings us information on what constitutes a healthy weight for your pet. Town Talk takes us to Duxbury Town Hall, and we have a studio musician from Kingston live on the set. It's a great show, and we begin at the Plymouth Library. This past Friday, the Plymouth Public Library had the grand opening for its latest endeavor, an art gallery. Artists from all over the South Shore and Cape Cod had pieces featured on the main floor as well as upstairs. The library plans to make the gallery a long-term project, showcasing new artists every few months. Brian Sullivan was there for the first installment. It's not too often, if ever, that you'll get a chance to have a glass of wine at the Public Library. But on the evening of Friday, May 20th, they made an exception in Plymouth for the grand opening of the latest addition to the town's top resource center, an art gallery. It was an idea that had been in the works for Richard Swanson since joining the Board of Trustees over a year and a half ago. One of the things that I was very interested in doing was um, offering a, a, more, a better cultural experience for our patrons and at the same time uh, celebrate local artists. So this sort of... Um, handle both of those matters in a, a very nice way. The exhibit showcased artists from up and down the South Shore, ranging from Quincy to Cape Cod. And it's not just one medium being used for the art on display. The work of the more than 30 artists featured used watercolor, oil, photography, acrylics, and sculpture. And it was an upstairs and downstairs event, so all those in attendance could really just wander about, taking in the sights, and enjoy the festive mood, which isn't usually the norm in the library. The gallery's opening just happened to coincide with another exhibit that deserves some attention as well. Just to the left of the main entrance of the library, you'll see an exhibit called The Heart for Compassion, which was artwork done by local area high school students as they did renditions of photographs of Syrian refugees. The students came from different high schools, but were all involved with the Plymouth Art Guild. While the attendees for the gallery opening may not have known this exhibit was here when they arrived, they certainly knew about it when they left. What young people need is an opportunity. Uh, when they are given an opportunity, they, they rise to the occasion and, and look at the things they've created. Um, I'm just so impressed. Uh, it's my favorite part of, the, of this art exhibit. Oh, I'm very impressed. Um, for one thing, it's very young artists and they just captured this amazing feeling. Um, and the, and the depth and the intensity of what they've created is really amazing. Treating the library as an art gallery is a long-term plan. This exhibit will run for two to three months and will be switched out with a new exhibit featuring fewer artists but more of their artwork. We want the library to be a welcoming place, a place that people can come, connect uh, with information, connect with friends, and spend more time. So our, you know, one of my goals is to have them come here and spend more time rather than just check out a book and leave. Reporting from the gallery opening at the Plymouth Public Library, I'm Brian Sullivan for PCN. A wonderful thing that the libraries in the area are doing now, not only do they do art gallery things like that, but they have classes, they have plays, they do all kinds of things that libraries never used to do before. Yeah, I think people really take for granted just the amount of of opportunities that a library has. It's not just a room full of books anymore right. or even, you know, access to the internet like it was when I was in elementary school. Right. Um, there, yeah, I mean, it's just a place full of opportunities and I'm glad that they're making a community event and fun right. and engaging right. and good for them. And it's a great place to showcase art. Absolutely. The Plymouth Area Coalition for the Homeless held its second annual fundraiser featuring some local stand-up comedians. 
The benefit event was filled to capacity at the Knights of Columbus in Kingston, but PCN was able to squeeze in to get the laugh out loud story. Tonight is another great night. This is the second year we've done this. This is a comedy show to, for the Plymouth Area Coalition. Um, and it was, I started it last year and thankfully it was a big success. Um, and we're doing it annual now. John Turco is one of the, the main headliner that we had, and we had him last year. He is hysterical. Actually, I've been to comedy shows before, not to, you know, but it's really been one of the best I've ever been to, even like in town. A good friend of mine, uh, Greg Deems, is on the board for the uh, Coalition for the Homeless, and uh, he asked me to put the show together, so that's how I got involved. This organization is really what I would consider very grassroots, community-oriented, families helping other families in need. So we don't have the fancy galas and the black ties. We're really just trying to get the community to come forward and realize that everybody needs a hand up in life. A lot of people that are homeless have generations of poverty, generations of substance abuse and domestic violence. And it's something that we don't like to talk about a lot, but I think families that are having a good opportunity in their life really want to help other families. So this is, I think, a little bit different. Whatever money tonight is great that we raise. We really would like people to know about it so they come again next year. Actually, we were sold out this year, which is really fabulous. And um, hopefully more people will get involved. Um, I know we're trying to think about putting things in, in local stores just to get our name out so people um, can, can see what we do and, um, and donate, hopefully. Great crowd last year. Looking forward to doing it this year. Uh, I think we've got a sellout tonight, uh, more than we had last year, so they're doing a great job promoting it. Great cause. A fundraiser helps to learn about an organization, but mostly we want people to remember they had a good time and come back next year. And maybe they become a volunteer. We're looking to get new volunteers, people to join our fundraising committee, and cultivate new board members so that this organization continues on for many years. The Mattachusett Garden Club in Pembroke oversees many lovely projects in town, including the flagpole garden at the library, the rain garden at Town Hall, and the flower garden at the Council on Aging. They meet regularly for planning and also organize a scholarship for graduating seniors. PCN met up with this active group to learn more about them and their future plans. My name is Mary Dollar, and I am the president of the Mattachusett Garden Club of Pembroke. We are a group of gardeners who come together um, for purposes of education, um, supporting one another, and to be of service to the community. We do a, a various uh, amount of activities. Last year we did a garden tour. Mm -hmm. We also made our very first calendar mm -hmm. um, in 19... Uh, 2013, we participated in the uh, parade that came to town, our 300th anniversary. We uh, do community service. We take care, take care and maintain the rain gardens at the um, town hall and police station. We also have been active at the Marshfield Fair in the fall when they have their fair um, with an exhibit. And uh, we've had a lot of fun, enjoy doing that together. Um, we also have plans to participate in uh, the Blue Star uh, Memorial Project, which is a project of the National Federation of Garden Clubs. Um, that began in 1946 as a way of welcoming the military back from World War II. It was a beautification program for the highways of the United States. And it's been going on since 1946, and uh, currently um, almost every state um, has these memorial markers. So we are currently in the process of looking for a location for that, and that would be um, to honor the Pembroke um, military, uh, past, present, and future. We also award a scholarship. Um, actually, this year we awarded two, and um, we put out a topic and the students who apply have to be, have completed at least one year of college. And so they write essays and judging from the essays, we award a scholarship. So that's another thing we do. 
One of the things that we have planned for this summer is um, we're going to do some garden tours. We do not um, usually uh, meet in the months of July and August, but um, we have decided this year that there are so many beautiful public gardens in New England that we're going to try to fill in those months by doing that. The ladies over at the Shock Yard in Plymouth are making a name for themselves in town in a good way. They've developed a reputation for keeping people in shape, holding fun events that bring the community together, and the philanthropy world is recognizing them for their generosity. They recently held their second Drum Circle fundraiser for the Greater Plymouth Relay for Life Foundation, and PCN was there. <laughs> Here at Shockyard, we feel it's really important to develop a sense of community with our members and with other folks that um, aren't members yet. And uh, one of the things we do every year is participate in the local Relay for Life, which supports American, the American Cancer Society. The idea to do the drum circle came one from, our, from one of our clients who, who has been doing some uh, drum circles herself before, and um, she just thought this would be a great space to do it. And so we host them about once a month. Um, and then it came time to uh, get ready for Relay for Life and we're always trying to come up with fundraisers that we can do as part of our Relay for Life team, um, fun things that we can do, social activities and events and we thought um, merging our drum circle with the Relay for Life would be great. All of the money from the drum circle is going to go to support um, the Relay for Life here in Plymouth and so our mission really is uh, in all of our activities uh, to come up with stuff that's fun, community driven and active and I really like how meditation is is helpful for you know centering yourself and uh, your general sense of well-being but also when you add the drums in it's a great way to make it physical at the same time. Shockyard has not only done an amazing job with their pre-relay fundraising such as the Strum Circle um, but they also do a lot of fundraising at the actual event Last year they taught us a flash mob, which was amazing and a lot of fun, and it brought a nice um, entertainment segment to our relay. And this year they're hosting a late night dance party. So they've just got an amazing amount of energy and just really keep um, you know, the relay spirit going all night long. Richard Breck leads the circle for us, and what he does is kind of help guide the rhythm. And generally, so we drum for about an hour, and there's sort of maybe four songs within that time and we just all follow each other collectively and he gives a little bit of guidance before and after and during um, but really it's just an individual expression. Drumming is a great way to sort of relieve tension, relieve stress. Um, it's great for people who have any sort of like illness or injury sort of um, you know relax and meditate, relieve some of the, the tension that they have. Um, so we thought this would be a great, great pairing. Really, we're just gonna keep finding opportunities to fit in and, and be a part of what um, Relay is doing for, for Plymouth. Pet Health brings us to Court Street Animal Hospital in Plymouth for some information on healthy weight for pets. Hi, I'm Norm Stillman, one of the vets at the Court Street Animal Hospital in Plymouth, uh, here for this week's pet, PCN Pet Health segment. Uh, this week I thought we'd talk about how to know how much to feed your dog and also how to know whether your dog is too heavy or, or too thin. Uh, Presley here is going to help me demonstrate. So there is no uh, proper dose of food for every single dog. There's no graph that, that just says 10 pounds, 1 cup, 20 pounds, 2 cups. Uh, it has everything to do with your dog's breed and her level of activity and her metabolism. But in general, what we really want is to, to be able to feel a dog's ribs distinctly, but preferably not see them. Uh, so that is, if I were to say to you that Presley has 13 ribs and ask you to show me where the 10th one is, ideally you'd say, okay, well, here's Presley's 13th rib. So 13, 12, 11, 10, there's her 10th rib right there. I can feel it distinctly and I know that Presley is a good weight. Also, when I look down on her from above, I like to see a little bit of a waistline right behind her, her last rib where she goes in a little bit. Uh, and that also tells you that she's an appropriate weight. Once you start to see her ribs, a little too skinny, 
And once you can't feel them anymore, a little too heavy, but right in between those two, there's a sweet spot where you can both, uh, you can both feel them and not see them. And, and of course that's perfect. Uh, how much food does it take to get there? Well, like I said, it's different for every dog, but in general, uh, your vet will tell you a good place to start. And then periodically, once a week or so, you can try to feel your dog's ribs. If, if your dog's ribs are not palpable, then back them off a little bit. If you're giving them a cup of food, why don't you drop them down to three quarters of a cup of food twice a day. Um, if, uh, if your dog's ribs are starting to show through, then if you're giving them a cup of food, bump them up to a, a cup and a quarter. Uh, you're gonna just uh, slowly approach the appropriate dose and that's gonna be just right for your dog, but maybe different for some other dog, even if that other dog's the same weight. Uh, and, uh, and that way you'll be able to keep them at an appropriate level. There are a lot of good reasons to do that. Good for their joints, their heart, their liver, and uh, of course they'll live longer and be healthier because of that. Uh, thanks so much for letting me join you today. I, uh, I hope that answered some questions and uh, look forward to talking with you again soon. Town Talk this week takes us to Duxbury Town Hall for an update. Hi there, I'm Rainy Reed, the town manager for the town of Duxbury, and I appreciate you tuning in. A couple of things I'd like our viewers to uh, consider in the coming weeks. Some information that I think we might find of interest. First off, uh, the town is going to be having a fall special town meeting on Monday, September 26th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, the reason for the meeting is multi-purpose. The first of which is the town needs to consider new flood insurance rate maps proposed by FEMA. This has been an ongoing project the town has been working on in conjunction with the towns of Situate and Marshfield. Uh, the, the need has arisen for us to have this special town meeting because we have a certain amount of time in which to have the maps adopted since the federal government has issued their letter to us stating that we are in need of new maps. So as a result, we've hired an outfit called the Woods Hole Group from uh, the Cape to help us with our understanding of the maps and the revisions that are necessary to make sure that we all have flood insurance. Uh, that's an important component here uh, because without it, we won't be, wouldn't be able to get uh, lending for some of the homes that are built on the waterfront or near the waterfront. So that's the primary driver for the September 26th meeting. Also on that warrant, we anticipate not just the FEMA flood insurance rate maps, but we also anticipate a discussion on a zoning proposal for an overlay district at the former Battelle site. Uh, that property is located on Washington Street, and it's uh, about an 11, 11 and a half acre parcel that a developer is contemplating changing the density of the property. Right now, if the property were, were to be developed, it would allow for probably six or seven residential units. In this case, uh, the developer is proposing 35 in a condominium type structure. Uh, there will be multiple hearings on that and we encourage anybody to, uh, that has an interest to pay attention to the uh, town's website because we will provide, be providing a lot of information in the coming weeks and months leading up to town meeting. It's a tight time frame, but we wanna make sure that people have as much input as possible on the way leading into that discussion on that important zoning change, which ultimately will be decided by the voters. Also on the warrant, we anticipate that there will be union contracts as we're working to reach a couple settlements for uh, different collective bargaining units. And finally, there will also be uh, some minor, what we consider minor housekeeping articles for zoning, most notably uh, some changes to the zoning maps that have been needed to be made over the years. Uh, there's an inconsistency between what we have posted on our website and the maps themselves, so we want to make sure that the two are in, in sync with one another. Also, another update for you is the Route 53 Winter Street project. This has been a project that's been ongoing for about the last two years. And the uh, contractor has, this is actually a state project, not a town project. The contractor has laid the base course of pavement out at the Winter Street intersection, and the new roundabout is functioning. Uh, there are multiple cones in, in place, uh, and we think that it's gonna be a much safer alternative to a tra traffic light, which had been originally contemplated uh, many years ago when the project was still in development, but it turned out that to use a traffic light would have not been the best idea, only because uh, it would have created a, a much un more unsafe environment for cars trying to zip through a red light, a changing red light. So they went with a roundabout and the project is uh, coming to its completion this fall. And finally, I wanted to mention uh, that on Monday, May 30th, will be the Memorial Day Parade here in town. Uh, it will start at the Standish Cemetery at 10 o'clock. It will go along Crescent Street, headed towards Hall's Corner, will turn through Hall's Corner, and will wind up 
right here near Town Hall at next door at the First Parish Church. And we encourage all of our uh, residents to join us and any non-residents too. It should be a good time and it's always a nice day. So thank you very much for tuning in and I appreciate you watching. Thank you all for watching. Replay times are listed on our website and you can find PCN on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. We love to end the show with local artists and tonight we're lucky to have a young Kingston singer-songwriter on the set. Take it away Maureen for our arts and entertainment report. Thanks so much, Julie, and thank you everyone at home for joining us for another arts and entertainment segment. Tonight we have on a young singer-songwriter, Emily McGrath from Kingston. Welcome, Emily. Thanks for having me. So you are officially the youngest songwriter who's ever joined us on our program. How does that feel? It feels pretty good. We're, we're psyched you feel that way. Um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about, you recently participated in the Spire Open Mic Challenge, and you made it through the first round. Can you kind of give us a little perspective on how it felt? You know, were you the youngest contestant? What, were, what was the competition like? Uh, there was definitely a couple people younger than me, but it was really weird because there was a lot of older people, and I'm not usually used to performing with so many, so many people, like, so professional, because I've always been around people my age. So I felt kind of like the underdog sitting there, but it felt really good that night because the night that I won the first round because you don't see many singer-songwriters as teenagers, so that felt really awesome. That's awesome. Congratulations. That's Thank really you. quite an accomplishment. So being a young songwriter, what kind of influences your music? Who, who are your influences? Um, a lot of bands and artists, especially I'm more of a like 80s rock kind of person so i'm in a lot of like green day and nirvana obviously i'm wearing their shirt um and a lot of newer stuff like newer bands like and artists like demi lovato and some of hank's work and a lot of the songwriting of um made a parade because of the stories they tell in their songs i think that's really influential on my songwriting great um what will you be playing for us tonight i'm going to be playing a song that i wrote be called mistakes we'll take it away